Good evening. I'm Francis Levy, co-director of the Philip Tatey Center. Dr. Edward DeSessian is the other co-director. Hi. Uh, and welcome to Music and Imagination, the Rhythmic Brain. Now, I'm very proud and happy to present Stephanie Chase. Stephanie Chase is the artistic director of the Music, Severe, of, Music of the Sphere Society. Yes. And she's also a violinist. And she's played here before. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> to our pleasure. Thank you. And Thank Stephanie you. Will, will be our host tonight, and she's going to introduce our distinguished guest. Thank Thanks, you, Stephanie. Francis. Thank you. Thank you so much for coming tonight. Um, when you mentioned the, uh, the title of this exhibition, I was thinking of weather and imagination. I think the weather tonight is not quite as bad as people imagined it might be. But, so thank you for coming, and I'm sorry, I kept some people away. Um, a couple of years ago, um, I was doing a little bit of research on the internet, and I was looking for somebody to give, um, well, to consider for our guest, as our guest lecturer. We have pre-concert lectures before our concerts, before many of our concerts at the Music of the Sphere Society, um, exploring different aspects of music. And so I, I forget what the search terms were that I had put in, but I came up upon Eric Barnhill's um, website, and I read about his work, and I realized that he was on our mailing list as well. So I thought, well, this is fortuitous. And read a bit more, and I found that um, it was extraordinarily interesting, and it's a field that I know so little about, so I'm going to turn it over to him almost immediately. Um, but I do want to read you his bio. Um, Eric Barnhill is the creator of Cognitive Eurythmics and currently practices at the Optimal Health and Development Center in Westchester and in private practice in Manhattan. He has used the curriculum with Alzheimer's, Attention Deficit, Tourette's, Autism Spectrum, and other neuromotor and neurodegenerative disorders. He received a Feldenkrais Practitioner Certification from the Feldenkrais Movement Institute, a Dalcroze Certification from the Dalcroze School of New York, and a Master's in Piano Performance from the Juilliard School. So he's also a very accomplished pianist. And I see that you did the Goldberg Variations recently. Yeah. A series of so wonderful pianists. It's my pleasure to welcome Eric Barnhill. Thank you. So thanks very much for having me, and, and thank you very much for inviting me to, to sure. speak here. And uh, what I thought I would do was just give you a little background information, and I know you like it to be more relaxed and conversational here, so uh, maybe once I've just thrown a bit of background at you, uh, I'd also uh, would very much like to get into a little demonstration of some of the techniques I use, some of the stories from my practice. And maybe we can just mix that in with going back and forth and so forth. So uh, just to get things started, uh, Stephanie gave you a little bit of my background. Uh, I studied piano in graduate school. While I was there, I got very interested in what are called these alternative methods, uh, alternative practices that are sometimes taught at performing arts conservatories. I got into Alexander Technique and Feldenkrais Method and Tai Chi, which I've been doing for 12 years, and also Del Croce Rhythmics and uh, some other things. Uh, so by the time I graduated, I was about equally interested in the piano that I had come there for and all these alternative kind of body-mind disciplines. And I sort of pursued them equally over the next few years. My first few teaching jobs, and uh, many of the places where my practice took root, uh, were out in the suburbs, like a lot of people who graduate from music school. And uh, I very eagerly took special needs students. Uh, I really like teaching them. They tend to really like music. They're often very brilliant about music when they're not uh, necessarily performing well in other mainstream disciplines. And so it was something that fascinated me a lot. Uh, after I did this for a while, I started to notice that I, I looked at their problems differently than other people seemed to be looking at them. And where people often saw someone who uh, had very little self-control or had very little ability to focus, I often saw a body that couldn't organize itself into a beat. Uh, thanks to Del Crows, which is a method of teaching music through movement, I often use movement in my lessons. Uh, I would also have students who had tremendous difficulties with attention attention deficit and hyperactivity and so forth. And often they were brilliantly rhythmic and musical when it came to beat. But when it came to meter or some sort of larger hierarchical structure of music, it all sort of fell apart. They couldn't hold through that structure. And lastly, I would often work with children who had speech, language, reading difficulties. And I found that if I could get them to move in a way that corresponded with their use of speech, and I could get their speech to reflect their movement, that I could get great change in their ability to to use language. So I began to wonder why music had this effect that it did. And so I set about trying to explain it, trying to find research that would help me explain it. 
Um, and so it's been many, many years doing this now. And I've sort of put a book together that's near the end of its process. And, uh, and I have this theory. And I just wanted to quickly go over the points with you. And then we'll open it up to questions on that. And then I'll talk to you a little bit about, uh, about my practice. So I'm going to, one, go over to the chalkboard here and just talk a little bit about the brain. The idea, the main idea is that music, the rhythms and features of music, through the gateway of movement, I'm going to try this one. I hope this is at all visible. Through the gateway, oh yeah, much better. Through the gateway of movement, impact psychological processes, which in turn can impact the structure or at least certain aspects of the functioning of the brain. This is my theory. And I've compiled this from a lot of different researchers. And what I thought was really interesting was these researchers are often considered somewhat marginal in their disciplines, let's say. They're considered not, not illegitimate in any way, but an alternative viewpoint. And yet when I stacked up all the reading I had been doing, I found this very clean line that seemed to unite them all together. So whereas they might all be on the fringe of how that discipline is looked at, altogether it seemed like a very parsimonious way to think. It seemed like the mind and music and the brain were all doing the same sort of thing. Okay? And that was the theory that I put together. So I'm, I'm going to start from the top and work my way down. Uh, at the top, I want you to consider two alternative ways that we think of the brain's content. And the most traditional one is structure. And the other way that is more and more popular and more and more interesting to a lot of people studying the brain is pros process. Okay. Structure, uh, a good example of a concept that describes brain content in terms of structure or architecture is a hypothetical thing. And again, it doesn't get any more technical than this. A hypothetical thing known as the grandmother cell. The idea here is that the brain has a hierarchy of a pyramid, like uh, the way we think of a corporation, for example. And you have lots and lots and lots of worker drones at the bottom and more and more executive functioning on the way up. So for example, uh, I might have uh, neurons near the eyes perform very basic recognitions. Then a second layer will perform associations on those recognitions. Another layer performs associations of combinations that it recognizes there. And on and on and on until you get to the top of this pyramid and you've got thing-specific cells, right? So once all these associations add up in a critical way, you have a grandmother cell that says, bing, that's my grandma, right? So that's the idea you have this pyramid structure, okay? This, uh, and, and though it's obviously overly simplistic, this general idea is still accepted by a lot of people or you know, considered to have some validity. Now on the other side, process, I want you to consider something called the 40 hertz hypothesis, which is based on the work of a lot of people, but Francis Crick was the guy who put it this way. The idea here is that there's constant rhythms in the electrical activity of the brain going on all the time. And it's the speed and the nature of those rhythms that really determines what's going on. More than the content of any cells, let's say, more than any particular architecture, it's the rhythm that's creating the content. Right? And in this hypothesis, different groups of neurons in the brain start to oscillate at the frequency of 40 hertz, which is 40 times a second, when they are, being, when they are part of our conscious perception. So we know, for example, when we do neuroimaging, we have a pretty good idea which parts of the brain are impacting you know, the scene that we have as a conscious, uh, conscious person, because all those parts are oscillating at 40 hertz. And the interesting thing is this allows, there, there's a big problem in neuroscience called the binding problem, right? I have things coming in through my ears and through my eyes and through my muscles and my memories. How does that all cohere into one scene, right? One coherent idea. And that's, that's called the binding problem. And in the rhythmic model of the binding problem, everything doesn't have to be connected to each other all the time. Because if I'm oscillating at one frequency here and one frequency here, these two parts know they're in sync, even if they're not directly communicating. So all these little patches that are oscillating at 40 hertz are the parts that are currently conscious. That's the idea. So that's just one of the most prominent examples of a theory in which rhythm and process is more important to the content of what's going on in your head than the actual structure, the, the chemicals and, <clears throat> and the molecules and so forth. 
All right, so and that's, that's all I'm going to touch on in terms of brain. Now, in terms of mind, uh, I found a number of very interesting thinkers, some of whom I've met, uh, and all of whom kind of knew each other, but none of whom are necessarily too central to their field. Um, they're in the, the field of psychology, and the first one I became interested in was J. Uh, J. J. Gibson, James J. Gibson. Okay. Now, Gibson was a specialist in optical perception, vision. And when he started studying vision, people wanted to know how the eye perceived a two-dimensional picture. <clears throat> and that was basically it. And they figured, well, we look at how the eye perceives a square on the wall or a circle on the wall, and we figure out how that works, and then we'll go to more complex things from there. We'll work our way up. And he felt that this was never going to go anywhere because there was no way to isolate any one part of vision from any other, and that included self-movement. So that he felt movement was as much a part of the visual <clears throat> apparatus as the eye. Okay? Um, I have a, let's see, I'll just give you this one quote of his. Uh, Looking around and getting around do not fit into the standard idea of what visual perception is. But note that if an animal has eyes at all, it swivels its head around and it goes from place to place. The single frozen field of view provides only impoverished information about the world. The visual system did not evolve for this. Okay? And as one of his followers says, just to bring this back to rhythm very clearly, uh, in dynamic events, movement, the things that would probably most interest us as a creature, <clears throat> uh, an integrated figural form usually involves the presence of a stable rhythmic pattern <clears throat> comprising various related periodicities. So what he's saying is, we're meant to move, or to be moved at, and to see things in motion, to perceive invariancies in movement over time, patterns over time, or rhythms, in the array of what we're perceiving. So for Gibson, the central thing that we're doing all the time is perceiving movement over our visual sense, and detecting patterns in that movement. Which in a way, as this follower said, is a very rhythmic, it's a very rhythmic activity. Two more people I want to just briefly run by. Mary Jones, a theorist of attention, who got going in the 1970s and is still, is still at it. She is <clears throat> the founder of something called the Rhythmic Theory of Attending. And again, for her, when she got involved in attention, people wanted to see how you would attend to what's called a static visual array. Again, something sta static and visual, right? But she says... When people hear friends engage in a conversation or listen to a familiar tune, when they watch a basketball game or when they observe a mother-infant exchange, they are engaged by temporally patterned changes. Such events comprise actions and movements that display distinct beginnings, recognizable rhythms, characteristic tempos, and lawful endings. An attentional theory that captures how we truly attend must consider how people respond when the object of attention changes in time. So again, she has the parallel, an absolute parallel to Gibson in the sense that her field is static and she sees rhythmic pattern and process as being more central than things that are static. Mary Jones, theorist on attention. And lastly, I want to go a little bit into communication. <clears throat> and here we have, uh, well, there's a lot of people I could credit, but Madeline Haynes and James G. Martin were two of the earlier people who worked on this problem. And this is a question of why we need music when we speak at all. But the voice goes up and down. People use rhythmic beats when they talk. And uh, there's a whole field of known as prosody, right? And why is that so important to us? Well, I'll just throw the money quote at you. Prosody and its constituent features generate an intonation contour which serves to bound <coughs> speech production into meaningful units. This enables the processing of information within as large a unit as possible without losing meaning or taxing the short-term memory. So just to elaborate on this, what we found since this research, what people have found since this research, is that when we are listening for meaning, we need the prosody. And without it, we can barely get through a standard English sentence. And we know this from, well, there are lots of different ways that we know this, but one of them is when we have computers spit out words without any kind of rhythm or intonation, our, our comprehension drops by 
So when people talk, they generate a framework. They're projecting a framework that this sentence is going to follow. And when they do that, you can hang expectations on that. And that allows you to navigate the sentences that most people are saying to you. And if they didn't have that prosodic contour, you wouldn't be able to follow them at all. So really without music, this comp uh, communication through standard English sentences is basically not possible. Most interestingly, in reading, a lot of reading difficulties are connected with um, something that's called phonological recoding. And that means that people are inside regenerating the prosodic contour of the spoken version of what they're reading, even if it's very quick. And there's a great experiment that proved this in 1982 called the tongue twister experiment, in which, uh, in which sentences that had some kind of very difficult phonetic quality, but otherwise were grammatically no more difficult than others, were much more difficult to comprehend. We had, they had people had to take much more time. And that was considered part of the evidence that we rely heavily on phonological sound-based memory in order to read. So it doesn't even go away during reading. I bring up these three people because I'm going to show you some demonstrations in which I <clears throat> work on these three general areas, perception and prediction, attention and reading, and communication. So my theory is that all of these different rhythms, in a way I was somewhat able to outline here, uh, connect together. That just as rhythmic process <clears throat> is becoming central to our study of the brain, it's also, it, it may be that these theorists, who are not necessarily at the center of their field, are right in line with what's coming. And so I developed my theory based on this research. <clears throat> and my belief is that the key missing component here is movement. And when we move, to music, when we take the idealized patterns and rhythms of music, when we take it into our movement, and our voice, and our speech, in an integrated way, it, allow, it, it becomes a teacher. And it can teach us better, more efficient, more functional ways to go about our, rhythm, our rhythmic processes of mind. And that ultimately, developmentally, this can have an impact on the neurological processes of the brain. There is something called, uh, with the terrible name of slaving, which is the last thing I want to mention to you, which is my best guess as to the mechanism by which all the, by how all this works. It was invented by Hermann Hocken, who was the inventor of the laser. And he, I don't know if you know how a laser works, but normally light, uh, the phases of light are diffuse. They spread out all over the place. They're all on their own. Given certain conditions, all these waves <clears throat> spontaneously form into one beam of light, a wavelength, a wave of practically infinite length. And that's what a laser is. That's why a laser is so powerful. And he formulated this general idea that large vibrations can take over small ones and unite them together. So that a large picture can dominate the small picture. Uh, Georgi Bushaki, who's a uh, neuroscientist at Rutgers, also believes that this happens in the brain. He says that he studies a lot of rhythmic oscillators. And the larger oscillators, the broader patterns, typically order together and orient the smaller patterns. They sort of, they, they are the uh, bigger orderers in the brain and they wrap the picture together, okay? So my belief is music can have this function for us. And through movement, it can penetrate into these processes and give them, give them order where there was none and help people with special difficulties overcome them. What I thought maybe I could do is take questions or comments on that and then out of that work into some demos and some Stories. Yeah. Oh, I mean, sometimes I'm aware of reading to myself in a, in a, as if I'm reading out loud. But suppose you're not doing that. How does the prosody come come through in that case? It's it's really by experiment that they've had to get at that. So, reading this versus reading that, they hypothesize that some things are going to be more impacted. You know, if we had to phonologically recode inside our minds to read this, then this would be harder than this or this type of sentence would occur less frequently than this. And then we have, you know, if they feel there's no other <clears throat> really good reason why that would be so, they regard that as evidence that we recode, that we regenerate the sounds in order to comprehend the sentence. So it's all deduction, you know, and the, the details of it kind of go on and on, and there's, there's different <clears throat> schools of thought. But I have a little of your water. Yeah. I'll get Oh, <laughs> I'll get your out. Okay. You have it. <laughs> all right. I have a question, actually, regarding what you said about the, uh, the 40 hertz hypothesis. Mm -hmm. how, how was it arrived at 40 hertz? I mean, what was the process for determining that frequency? 
because that's basically an E flat if you if you multiply it up, right? Y yeah, yeah. I think I worked that out one time. Yeah, it was something like that. Very so, low. So how was it uh, determined? Though? And so then I thought I'd make a CD that was all E flat. Sell, yeah, well, sell I mean, it. It's a I brain. Mean, the universe is supposed to have a B flat, so I'm thinking, well, yeah. maybe you know we're a perfect fourth of the universe. Yeah, we're all E flats yeah. inside. <laughs> so yeah. Um, so I was curious, what was the problem? Well, they you know they measure all these different oscillations uh -huh. you know, using uh, neuroimaging and related techniques. And this one, uh, well, <clears throat> the main organ to know about is the thalamus, which is considered the kind of the ga a gateway in the brain, right? And basically, all the lower brain functions pass through it to get to the higher brain functions and vice versa, and it's happening all the time. Plus, the thalamus has these spindles that go all the way out into all the areas. So it's kind of in what a feng shui person would say is the power position of the brain, right? And, uh, and it emits this constant 40 hertz pulse that neurophysiologists feel unifies all the different activities of all the different modules into one coherent signal. Uh -huh. So that's what they've measured. That's the, the pulse that they've measured. That is so interesting. And of course, when you take the, um, the hertz frequencies and double them, you get the octaves. So that I figured out it was an E flat roughly <coughs> because I doubled it up to 80 and then 160 and then 320 and 640 and then, you know, A for 40 is what we tuned violence do you, to. Do you think so, in the Baroque period, people's uh, thalamus? I, I'm just wondering weird. about that, yeah. <laughs> That's fascinating. I mean, also, I mean, would this mean that people might have a, a more of an affinity to E flat major, for instance, than other keys? You know, because you think about like Mozart writing a lot of things and. Yeah, these are the things you that. You know, and, and, well, and heroic. Of course, he had a different E flat than we did, maybe. It, well, I, I, it's sort of a low, I'd have to like, get a calculator to really tell you where it is, yeah. but... Uh, um, well, you know, I try to avoid <laughs> jumping to any conclusions, conclusions that are a little yeah. too facile. Uh -huh. <laughs> yeah, all right. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, no, I, I agree with you. I've thought about that. The, the universe is uh, rethinking E-flat and what that could possibly... You know, if, if that would impact something I'm doing, I definitely think about that. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I mean, I go through movements, so I'm not that concerned. There are people, you know, there's been a lot of work on this music into the brain and... That's generally how people think of understanding music is, is your brain takes it in and your brain responds to it. And this is such a modern idea, you know, because it used to be your response to music was always action. And I think that it should still be, really. And that maybe, let's say, a concert hall is a very special case. And the reason you're enjoying the concert hall is because you have a repertoire of action that you've sort of embedded in yourself. And you, mm -hmm. so, then, so then you have an affective response to what you're hearing. But I think the fundamental, you know, the fundamental way to appreciate music is through action, whether making it, moving to it, both, a mixture, some kind of freely changing thing that you're doing, uh -huh. you know. I, I think we had some questions still here, I'm sorry. Yeah. Before I go on too much. Um, excuse me, is there, like, to have, these, have you studied or heard of any specific kinds of movements, um, whether that be through music or dance or something that helps the person get to that 40 hertz level to... Uh, well, you know, you ha I, I, so um, a little bit about my background that I didn't go over that much. I teach a method of music education that teaches musical concepts through movement. And so that ends up with rhythmic movement in time to music and getting better and better and better at that and having that be more and more fluid so it's not simply this kind of thing but really a very, something that is really a musical movement. And, uh, you know, the way that that would impact anything underlying is, is really speculation at this point, and I would love to have the resources to see if there's any way to measure some kind of palpable difference. You know, when I take people with uh, Parkinson's through something like this, and their Parkinson's is reduced, or their Tourette's is reduced, we know that those problems are tied deeply to the thalamus and this issue of, of uniform 40 hertz vibrations going out, breaking down. Right? They both have to do with an inability to inhibit movement patterns in certain ways because that unifying signal is not reaching them. And, it's, and we also know that when you play music, thing, that often helps people like that already. And my, my belief why is because it then can kind of substitute for what's missing in the, the thalamocortical network. And what I would like to do with cognitive eurythmics is create a practice so that people, can, uh, people don't need to rely on external stimulus like music to have those effects we see when you play music with Parkinson's, but rather they have enough music inside. There's a question there. It struck me as remarkable that the English language, a sentence produced by me, you, a announcer, an actor, is full of rhythmic change. And the rhythmic change can be very variable. Still, it produces something we call meaning. 
and, and what's so remarkable is that the rhythms can be so variable, and, and we're so used to them, using them right now, yeah. so that uh, this need to produce rhythms uh, is intrinsic to, to the use of, of language and, and to the reception of, of that language by somebody else who's listening. Mm -hmm. but not all languages have that much rhythm. For example, in Spanish, very often, it goes along on a monotonous note and then drops or goes way up at the end. This is a very, this is a custom, or this is, but in English, certainly, there's an enormous amount of variability in the course of any given sentence. So these rhythms are constantly affecting us. They're like, we're listening to music as well as words. Yeah, the old, the, the research on, on rhythm and music and speech has been snagged by a few things. Actually, one, what, what I think, uh, there is an old distinction of stress time versus syllable time languages. I don't know if you've ever heard of this. And languages like English and German, where the accent tends to stay in the same place and we smush the syllables to fit the accent, those are called stress time languages. And languages like Italian and Spanish and more Mediterranean languages, where the syllables tend to have the same length, but we, you know, the, there's sort of an arc that emerges above that. Uh, those were called syllable time languages. Now that distinction is not absolute, so the skeptics have kind of won, and nobody's really researching that right now. But what's so amazing to me is that additive rhythms, all the music in additive rhythm, which is when you derive your meter by adding together eighth notes in combination of twos and threes, so you know. That's not so much a, 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 a Germanic rhythm, right? That's more of a Mediterranean rhythm. Those tend to come from areas with what used to be called syllable timed languages. And music that has strong, even beats tended to come from languages that were considered stress-timed. So I regret that that distinction is not considered absolute enough that anybody's looking into it anymore, because I think there's tremendous significance there between culture, language, and music. Um, yeah, I'll go. Uh, I just wanted to comment that um, people are taught to speak by speaking, hearing people speak, and particularly by being spoken to by usually mother or some kind of mother figure. And whatever kind of language you learn, your mother's voice is music. Mm -hmm. So I think perhaps the distinction between English versus some other language or even, you know, stress versus syllables, um, I, I think that the, the, the metaphor of, of what you learn as being, as being musical and having some meters that, that shape your world and have meaning, I think that's true no matter what language. Yeah, that's just my personal thought. Well, I I do too, and and I you know because they can't find this ex exact beat in the speech signal, they've kind of given up in researching that much about rhythm and spoken and <clears throat> spoken words. But you know, Paul Zukowski did this famous study at Bell Labs in which you really can't find the beat in the acoustic signal of most classical music performances either. There's just always flexibility. And there's not an exact mathematical beat in, in music performance either. But this has sort of caused a lot of speech, re speech researchers to, to give up a little prematurely, in my opinion. Uh, it's work that I think I've gotten results with, and I would love to see you know, more research done in that direction. So, yeah. I just have a question regarding your rhythm, which is, do you find that it is increasingly helpful as a collaborative effort? I mean, I'm just wondering, there's a lot of egos that will all gather in one room to perform your rhythm. And if you sort of see those egos bumping into one another, or if often they sort of combine to create one rhythm? Um, well, first of all, there's, there, I want to make the, the, the always confusing distinction between <clears throat> your rhythm and your rhythmics. Mm -hmm. um, your rhythm. Your rhythm is something uh, uh, created by Rudolf Steiner for the uh, Waldorf school system. And uh, it does involve moving rhythms of speech and music. Dalcro's Eurythmics, which came out at roughly the same time in another <clears throat> in Switzerland as opposed to Germany, shares the name but not that much else. Uh, Dalcro's Eurythmics was a, a method of education for conservatory students uh, because Dalcro's had uh, many conservatory students whose rhythms were kind of wooden. But he felt that the rhythms by which they walked and moved around the room were just what he was looking for. So he tried to devise a system in which people could tap their natural sense of rhythm in order to use that in their music. And that's a process that is very similar to what I'm using here, so that they have the music sort of already inside of them, and they're trying to draw it out into a technique of performance, and in so doing, give life to the, to the performance. Um, in terms of the egos in the room, you know, Dalcros believed that his method could be a unifier of peoples. You know, and he uh, really enjoyed, in Geneva, he, uh, in, in Switzerland, pr probably Geneva actually, he put on mass spectacles where many, many people would move in coordination. He believed this create, could create harmoniousness among the people. 
And it's true in Delcourt, it's also true in Feldenkrais lessons, that as the lesson goes on, people tend to be more and more of a similar mind and tend to function more and more together. And I think it's, uh, there's an extraordinary way, you, you know, the standard format for a Delcro's class, just like with a lot of my classes, is uh, a teacher at the piano and everybody else moving. And there's a way that that music at the piano and everybody immersing in it connects everybody. Yeah. Eric, you, uh, I was just commenting with those, the sound of those ice cubes against the glass, and that seems kind of particular. No, but seriously speaking, you talked about certain kinds of therapeutic intervention with respect to inhibiting certain kinds of symptoms with, with in, in Parkinson's and Tourette's. Mm -hmm. But I'm not getting, as someone who doesn't, isn't really uh, you know, immer immersed in this field, I'm not getting a clear picture of, on, on a deeper level of the kinds of kind of cognitive uh, work you do. Uh, could, could you uh, give us an illustration, mm -hmm. say, of working uh, with uh, a student uh, that has the, a, a disorder of the mind in terms of, of, of the taking in of information along the line you referred to in, uh, with respect to reading, say. Could you give an, a, you know, kind of a, um, a, a sort of a more specific illustration of how you work these kinds of techniques? Oh, okay. <laughs> okay. I can't actually back up. I don't move. All right, so I'm, I'm a guinea pig. <laughs> yeah. So I'll just show you a couple of the most. These actually, I'm not going to go for language right right away. You see, the language one will be the trickiest to do with our situation. But um, but uh, Stephanie, if you could just. Um, but one of the things I I tell parents and I often show them is that uh, prediction is often called the brain's first function. Uh, and that really is the ability to synchronize it and train with the elements in the world around you. And, uh, and pe uh, parents who have children with certain kinds of special needs are often stunned to see the weaknesses children have in certain kinds of basic prediction. Nobody ever seems to test for this. And often when you tune up their ability to predict and synchronize and coordinate very elementary with the world around them, you get results. So um, could you please... Uh, I'm going, to, I'm going to play you a beat. Could you please count off ten of them, please? Whenever you're ready to start. One, yeah. two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Easy for Stephanie. Not easy for children with special needs a lot of the time. You might get three, and then they will just peel off. They will peel off. Or, I mean, even, yeah. Yeah, or another one that would be trickier is count off ten of these. One. Two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Yeah. Now there's one where, for example, that space would throw off a lot of kids because uh -huh. uh, the way they count things up, once they get in that, they, they might be able to attend sufficiently in a very small moment to get on that track of counting with the stimulus. But then you can do a lot of things to reveal that they're really just working on their own after that. And you know, anything you change about the drum, the tempo, or the rhythmic pattern, or if I set the drum on fire, or whatever, I mean, they, they can count to 10 in the way that they've set, but they're not with you anymore, mm -hmm. you see? And so parents are often stunned to see that, that they actually cannot actually they, they, stay with 10. They've sort of trained a certain, in a certain manner, and they have a rather inflexible approach to it, you're saying, that they, they have problems. Their with window that. of what they're taking uh -huh. in, I mean, I mean, kids fool you, you know, their window is, it is at any moment so narrow in terms of an arc of attention over time mm. that they take something in and they go with it until they're given feedback. Bad, good, and then they adjust it. It would be a terrible way to, you know, it would yeah. be very difficult, uh -huh. you know. Um, so now, uh, while you do that counting, I'd like you to clap and step with, with, the, with the beats. Okay. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Good. Again, easy for Stephanie. Not I don't know. <laughs> I'm getting worried here. <laughs> um, I, I, and, that, and this is a real giveaway because <clears throat> children with certain kinds of special needs and learning disorders have one walk that they tend to stick to and uh -huh. one way of talking that they tend to stick to and they, synchronizing them up is, un, is something they have never tried to do and they absolutely can't do it and they don't know they're not doing it. Okay, bring it. Yeah. You know? Right. Uh, <laughs> one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. How many steps did you take? Ten. For sure ten. No way that knowing that wasn't 10. Mm -hmm. There is no synchronicity there. Mm. And I find that just tuning up their ability to 
you know, let's say they have a thought and then they have the language of the thought and then they have the movement. Just getting them synchronized. And that's one of the most very basic things that I do in terms of developing cognitive capacity. Now actually we could take this example right into some of the stuff I do with language, although we're a little stuck for a mobility. But, um, but uh, if you could repeat after me, hickory dickory dock. Hickory dickory dock. The mouse ran up the clock. The mouse ran up the clock. The clock struck one and down he run. The clock struck one and down he run. Hickory dickory dock. Hickory dickory dock. Okay. Now I want you to clap that instead of saying it after I, after I say it. Okay. Hickory dickory dock. The mouse ran up the clock. That, so I can have kids who can clap that perfectly and not, and not say it with any kind of rhythm. And not know that there's I'm, a difference. I'm better at clapping than and saying. not know that there's a difference. <laughs> yeah. And now I would say, I would say, let's, you know, let's let's clap it and say it together. One, two, ready and hickory dickory dock. The mouse went up the clock. Okay. And just doing that, just tying in their speech to their movement. <laughs> nice job. I worked with my trainer today, so. <laughs> Compared to what she had me do, this is easy. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, um, so in something like that, uh, you can have kids who are very brilliant with their body but have a reading disability. Suddenly, you can show them that this doesn't connect. They can see that, and it's very concrete to them, and they can often fix it. And then, often, their speech is very different when they're done. I, if I could actually interject something, because yep. um, I want your input on something that is difficult for me. I'm working on the suite from Stravinsky's um, L'Histoire du Soldat. Um, it's in several movements. I'm doing the version which is violin, clarinet, and piano for a concert that we're doing next month. And I've never played this music before, and I really haven't heard it very much. And, and I find with Stravinsky's music that um, the coordination aspects are so difficult yeah. that I'm having to train myself in a way that I normally don't have to train myself. First of all, there's the visual perception of the music because I have a lot of chords, and so it's three notes instead of one note at a time. And it's not, it, it might be moving by quickly, but I'm trying to do it under tempo. But, and, and I'm playing chords are basically in first position, so it's not like I'm even having to negotiate around the instrument very much, but just the three notes at one time, the, the having to rearrange my fingers, and then the rhythmic aspects of it. Mm -hmm. Because then he'll throw in some, and there, again, it's not terribly, terribly difficult in and of itself, but you start putting all these things together mm -hmm. and it's just, yeah. you know, uh, and it's, you know, and so I'm, I'm working very slowly through this, but, um, you know, and it's, it, it, a lot of the rhythmic things, he's very tricky for the musician because he'll give you a 5-8 bar, meaning that you're thinking in terms of eighth notes moving along instead of quarter notes. Mm -hmm. so, um, so eighth notes will be five of those, and then he'll give you something else, and it might even be five followed by a three. And so he has a pattern, bum, 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 which in and of itself may not be that difficult, but if you're having to coordinate all these other things going on, the brain is so preoccupied. Yeah. And so I'm thinking to myself, well, he's saying five plus three, well, what if I make it four plus four? That's a lot easier. So I'm actually rebarring some of this music just mm -hmm. so I can you know, internalize it a little bit more easily. But I, you know, I was thinking about all these things you were talking about, you know, the visual per perception, you know, just the reading aspect of it, but then also things to link into, um, and, uh, you know, just sort of the coordinating aspects. It's, it's a real challenge, and thank God yeah. it's only a couple minutes long. Yeah, <laughs> this be much more. <laughs> well, and you bring up what has one been one of the most affirming things that I've found about this work, which is that I see no distinction. I see no distinction between what somebody's going for when they're just trying to, you know, catch a ball, and what, and on the very other end of it, what a high performer is going for with some, you know, insanely sophisticated, multi-layered, uh, you know, piece like that, Stravinsky's, you know, histoire. I mean, I really think that, you know, it's all about an ability to internalize. Well, and also, ultimately, we're yep. working with muscle memory, too. Mm -hmm. and, and I think that, for a musician, is a very important aspect that, you know, we're dealing with all these other things. But once you have started practicing, you're dealing with familiarity. And um, something that I was thinking about in terms of language and rhythm and, you know, a little bit about what you've been talking about is the sense of narrative. That, for instance, if I'm performing a piece and I'm, 
I, I know it well and I've, I've you know, prepared it well and I feel comfortable with it. It's a sense of getting into a narrative. You're like you're sort of stepping on onto some, a conveyance that's moving along. Mm -hmm. You recognize the, the landmarks along the way, but, um, but that has to also do with familiarity. And when things are not familiar, you know, in terms of having heard it or not heard it, in terms of the rhythmic structures, in terms of Oh, the, the 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 note combinations and the chords that I'm having to do. It's a real yeah. challenge. Okay. Yeah, I really think it's a very fundamental fundamental thing that can be uh, that yeah has to do with performance and people, you know. And I think that well, I mean, I, so I, I definitely see a very deep a deeper instructive aspect to music that I just think it's a tool for anybody to you know continue to pursue you know knowledge and development of themselves. You know, and, and, and it's all on a spectrum, in my, in my yeah. sense. You know? Bonnie has a question. Well, you know, when I was listening to you, Stephanie, talking about how you were trying to approach this obviously extraordinarily complex situation that you're trying to deal with, at least extraordinarily complex to me, maybe not so much to you. But, you know, and then, then you think about the fact that there are children, often children, but sometimes adults, for whom the simplest negotiation of language or thought or speech is as complicated for them as right. this tremendously right. esoteric activity is for you, which which is part of the reason why I think that this approach is, is so wonderful. And of course, one of the, something that you have is that you have a substrate of of competence and confidence. You know, I mean, you approach this by saying, well, maybe I'll just divide this five and three into four and four. But a child who has no confidence, no sense of satisfaction, no sense of uh, being able to count on themselves to be an agent of change for themselves can't do that. And I think that's where the, the kinds of interventions that you make must make a tremendous difference. Because it must take sometimes people who have never been able to create this for themselves and show them that there are techniques for which they can begin to develop that sense of confidence and confidence that all future actions that are, that are going to be more complicated have to build on in, or, in order for them to be able to function any better, which I think is so interesting and exciting. Well, and and there's there, there's something deceptive about fluency of any kind, whether it's, you know, I mean, it's, it's funny, I've tried to learn certain musical skills later in life just to get that feeling of what people go through learning things the first time, you know. And uh, fluency fools you into thinking you're just doing it and anybody could do it. And we make assumptions on that level about so many different things. And with children, when they don't do it, we just assume they're being willful. You know, and they, and they may be getting emotional and then it's even harder to tell, let's say. But a lot of times, uh, you know, a lot of times a won't is really a can't. And until you can take things apart and look at mechanisms, you don't know. You really almost never know. You know the emotional readout you get it could, it could be telling you what's under the surface or it might not be because the child, the child doesn't have a grip on it either. So I, I often find that you know, people believe my, my, my kid won't slow down, he won't listen to me, you know, he bangs stuff. You know, often, often if you just can take into their body an option, by getting them to move to music in a way that's new, that the music teaches them a new pattern of action, they'll use it. You know, they weren't being willful, they just didn't have an option that we thought everybody can just do. Did you want to do some more demonstrations, or should I sit down? Because I, I, I... Oh, I forgot you have to do this. Well, sort a, of, a, sort of, I'll, I'll take yeah. the question. Okay, all right, yeah. I'll, 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 I'll park, park myself back there. No, it's okay, there. I just don't mean to be standing all day. <laughs> in your readings, did you find out any learning styles, visual, audio, kinesthetic, did you find that there were structural brain differences among people of each learning um, preference? And also, second question is, did you find, do you think or did you find in your readings that musicians tend to be more kinesthetic learners? And a little interesting tidbit, I don't know who did a study, but a couple of years ago, someone did a study about um, big groups and, for example, audiences in concert halls and in theaters, and he found out that in European crowds, the applause would synchronize into one pattern, versus in America, the applause wouldn't as much as yeah. the crowds would. They tend to be unison clapping if they really like something. Well, you know, it's funny, Hawk and the inventor of the laser talks about unison clapping. I think it was, I thought it was somebody writing about Hawk, and I don't remember, but, you know, there's more volume in the auditorium with less effort when people go into that synchronized clapping. <laughs> and it's just like a laser beam. It's an example of spontaneous order, emergent properties and chaos. That might be like a cultural difference, too. 
Yeah, oh yeah. I think. also talk about a predilection or an ease of learning rhythms quicker in certain cultures than in others. Mm -hmm. Now, you know, brain differences in learner types, I don't know how far along that is. Uh, that reminds me very much of, you know, mo uh, multiple intelligence, and, uh, and uh, which is um, Gardner, Howard Gardner, right? Yeah. That's a friend of a friend of mine. And, uh, and, and so I don't know how far along that is, but I'm sure there's work being done on that that can be found. Probably Howard Gardner is a good locus point. Howard Gardner? Yeah. And then, and then the other thing you asked about was different learn or whether musicians were more kinesthetic learning types. And I would look into, I would look into, um, I'm trying to think of who, but it, you know, the field of music psychology is very interested in stuff like that. They're very, I mean, they're not, this sits a little bit outside of a lot of what I see there. Um, music psychologists who are very interested in every trait of musicians, you know, whether they're more visual or more auditory or people with perfect pitch, I mean, and they, you know, better at throwing the baseball, I mean, they're just really, they love to stay, people with mu musical training, uh, 10 years of it versus two, so that's where I would look for that kind of thing, yeah, music perception journal, What's, yeah, and mathematics, I mean, they love to study what musicians are, are like upstairs, so I, I would look there. When you were talking about languages just before, you reminded me, I lived in Hong Kong for seven years, I tried to assimilate and learn the language, I got a tutor, and she was teaching me Cantonese, uh, even though Mandarin is easier to learn, it's only ha had four tones, but everybody spoke Cantonese in Hong Kong at the time. And that was nine tones, and the teacher started teaching me the numbers first, right? I kept getting uh, the number nine wrong, because she kept saying, I said dog. I said, but it's gal. She said, I kept saying it the high oh, tone, right. and I kept saying dog. She kept getting annoyed at me, because there was all the different tones, and I kept getting it wrong. So. I mean, that language is, uh, I had to stop uh, a year of tutoring and I was getting nowhere because I'm oh, not musical. I don't know if that had anything to do with it, but it was so hard. I have nine tones in the Cantonese Chinese language. I mean, Mandarin is not considered then, an easy language. And then she forgot to tell Cantonese. me that the word gao, because I was trying to get it so right, also was a rude word if you said it was too high a tone. And I was asked by Classic, yeah. my administration manager for nine of some paperwork, and I said it, I was trying not to say dog. <laughs> Instead, she, she, I said the rude word, and they're all oh, shock hopes. And I said the rude word so perfect. And when I went back to my teacher, I'm going, why didn't you tell her this is also a rude word, not just nine and dog? Because all these different nine tones, I was getting so confused. I was just, oh, I just gave up after a year. What's the rude word? I said, yeah, oh, dick. I said, dick. Oh, something to that. I mean, uh, uh, forget about the characters, learning the characters. I was going phonetic. That's right? amazing. I mean, 10,000 characters and the students learned 3,000. And they're all oh. visual and tonal. It's, it, it's, it's, it was a night, I couldn't do it. I mean, I got the basic gist of it. You know, I could get a, a cab to take me to the right place. Um, <laughs> that's as far as I got. So that sounds, it was, yeah. It was interesting when you talked about the, the languages. Yeah. And the inflection. Chi yeah, yeah, Chinese was. Classical Chinese music is, is one of the most interested musics in pitches and bend. And almost no other culture takes nearly as much of an interest. And you have to just wonder what it sounds like to them. Because it probably sounds very natural to them. It sounds very unusual to us, certainly to me. I'm just you know, classical Chinese with all those bending pitches, I think it sounds very conversational. And you know, in Japanese, you tend not, you don't have those bent pitches, but you have quick movements among vowels. And the music, the flute music is over. They tend to be very pure toned instruments that they like, but it there tends to be a lot of that quick flittering. It's very interesting. I have a friend from Hong Kong who um, we, we've talked about this. In fact, the word ma has many different meanings. And so I said, can you, can you tell me all the different meanings and pronounce it for me? And he went through all the different tones. And it was extraordinary. But at the same conversation, we we're talking about the fact that Western, you can't put um, Western style music to Chinese lyrics because he said, you know, nobody will uh -huh. understand because you lose all the inflection. You've lost the, the sense of the, the tones, the pitches. Mm -hmm. And so it, ha it would be absolutely meaningless. They could be saying the words, you know, and putting them in, in a Western kind of song structure, but nobody would understand what was being, what was being sung in terms mm -hmm. of the language. Because mm -hmm. mm -hmm. so it would be just sound wrong. So, sorry, there's a question. Oh, 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 oh sorry. It's okay. along those lines. Do you have a technique of, of working with people who? speak in a monotone without inflection, without the prosody of the music of speech? Absolutely. I mean, that, and that is, um, that is something I don't have here, because the demos I picked for tonight don't, uh, didn't involve pitched instruments. You know, but, um, but the first most basic one is, is Papa Bear, Mama Bear, Baby Bear. 
and just getting them to say, I mean, a lot of times they are not, they, you know, just they don't even have access to trying to speak in the chest and trying to speak regularly, and trying to speak very high. And just using those three distinctions can often open a child up a little, a little bit. And then get, getting, the, you know, a lot of children with that kind of, something just happened? My ear just went. A lot of children with that kind of um, situation are, are very, very, very afraid to sing. Is it like a brain exercise, or is it more that just as, as soon as they start, in other words, you have to keep drilling them to the way you learn to play music, or is it more that once they become aware of the distinctions, it comes very quickly, almost automatically? I would say it, it, it varies. You know, I, there's often a big burst at the beginning when they first become aware of something, because as soon as it's brought into the light of their awareness, kids will often doggedly work to just go at it and, and fix it themselves. You know, once they concretely, once you can make the deficiency something concrete, uh, if it's a matter of something that's still not quite in the light of their awareness, I find they go at it again and again for quite a long time. And it tends to be at a plateau for quite a long time. And, uh, and then one day it'll kind of come through to them and they can see it. That, that's my general yeah, Pitch is, has to do with vibration and frequency yeah. in a different way than the, the meter of poetry, for instance. Mm -hmm. But does it fit into your theory that you're, in some way or other, when you're giving them the music of speech, not, not the rhythm of speech, but that that's part of this access to some kind of natural synchronizer, not rhythm perhaps, but something like that? I think we must be, we must be, you know, speaking in, in relationship to the, to the natural oscillators of the brain, right? I mean, whatever those are, however, whatever the real rules are by how we're speaking and thinking in language, you know, I think that a certain type of healthy rhythm underlies that. That's very connected to the body. So I think speech, you come at it from both ends. One, in training the body to be musical, you give them uh, something they can map speech onto. And I think that also definitely pitch work with xylophones and, and things like that. Um, or there's actually something called a boom whacker. Does anybody know what a boom whacker is? It's a big plastic tube that, you know, is, is perfect. I mean, you whack it to make the sound. It makes a very light sound for a very heavy movement. And then you can hit two together to make a chord. And then if you hit somebody with it, if they hit you, it doesn't hurt. So the whole thing's just perfect. And, uh, and I often, kids who are not ready to use pitch in their voice, I have them just try to make distinctions among the boom whacker pitches that might fit, say, I do a lot of work with animals and uh, animals in the story, so which would be the right one for, for Daddy Bear and which one would be the right one for, for you know, Mommy Bear. I'm sorry about the stereotype, but it works. It's a, and, and, and so forth. And just getting them to have any kind of reaction to pitch, you know, and, and gradually work toward taking it into their voice. And then, yeah, the, the first day that they somehow stumble onto a way to do it is often a big breakthrough. Uh, yeah, I was just uh, interested in, is that a new recent finding that the language of a culture um, is reflected in music? Or, because I usually it's, feel like the music or the nonverbal came kind of before the verbal, but the music had more effect on the speech because the speech is more of an intellectual um, faculty, whereas music is more like kind of, you just when you're a baby, you just start making sound. Yeah. Noises. And rhythms. And rhythms. So. Uh, I, I didn't mean to imply one preceded the other. It's definitely a chicken and egg. Yeah. One of these fascinating iterative things. Yeah. Yeah. But that, the research I'm talking about is mostly from the 70s because people sort of lost interest. But there's a new book, Language, Music, and Brain, and I know that guy. Uh, I'm pretty sure, I, mean, I don't know him personally, but from what I know of his work, is not so interested in beats, that type of thing, rhythm and speech. Yeah. How often is it difficult to teach someone? who doesn't understand differences, say, in pitch between high and low? And, and why do you think those sort of physical characteristics were ascribed to, to music? Why, why is something described as high and another pitch described as low? And what, what goes through our brain? You know, why, is, why, why do we use the adjective sharp to describe music when it, uh, you think of a sharp point you know, could cut you? What are these? Uh, well, you know, the Greeks had it the other way around. For the Greeks, the high notes were the low, and the low notes were the high. And, mm -hmm. and uh, 
What, what's that? What do you mean? Well, the, like the low notes on the piano, the, they would have they called those notes on their instruments high, and these other ones they called low. But who knows how they were thinking about it? You know, I mean, George Lakoff and all this metaphorical thinking. I mean, you know, they may have been turning it around in some way that you had to be there to mm -hmm. make sense of. Um, and then sharp and sharp and flat. I don't know what relationship that has to the medieval hexachords and all that. It may or may not be a purely experiential choice to come up with those words, but those are from, you know, I believe those came around the time of the medieval hexachord system, which predated contemporary tonality. So, um, but if, you know, if you're asking about people who have trouble mapping something, well, yes, in music education, I mean, when you're first teaching piano, or I, I don't know about other instruments, but you have to teach kids that this is the way to the high and that's the way to the low. You pretty much stuff that down their throat, I find. You know, they don't have an intuitive feeling about that. Generally, these are small and these are big if you were looking at it in terms of movement. The notes that feel small and the notes that feel big. But high and low, you kind of, it's just kind of it's like red lights and green lights. You kind of teach them that's the way it is. So, so it's you, interesting that that's true. Do you not find it intuitive? N no. No, generally not. Until you tell kids that, and unless they've picked it up, which is often true, they, they don't tend to know that. They tend to know big and small. What, what are the notes that feel big? The low notes. Yeah. Yeah. And you, I mean, I can even picture assaultive sounds in a high frequency with people tensing up and, and sort of moving upward to cover their ears and ducking for cover when, when a, a low frequency type of, of sound occurs. You know, it's, it seems it's an interesting that, hypothesis. Yeah. 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 I, I think it might be innate, but. I, yeah, I mean, in my experience in music education, it's not sufficiently innate that you can rely on it or, or drive any experiential path to it, but you, you tell them that's how it is. Uh, uh, yes? You, you mentioned how people with Parkinson's were able to move more easily when mm -hmm. they responded to music. Absolutely. But they also respond to um, visual patterns. And I was wondering, how do you explain that as well? Because, I mean, is it really, is it the music or is it a pattern? some sort of structure, uh, whether it's visual or oral, that they're really responding to. That's an interesting they, they, it, it seems like we need patterns to negotiate the world around us. Um, it's, that's my understanding of it anyway. And the other thing is, is in, in Alzheimer's, I mean, when somebody, one of the persons to go is the person's ability to drive a car. But they retain the ability to play the piano well into their illness. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, they can sit there and do something, which is also a very complex activity. Mm -hmm. And one, I mean, if one re does revolve a certain, you know, it's, it's a pattern that you have to uh, play the music. But driving a car, it's, it's a lot of, you're coordinating a lot of different movements, but it's not done in, in, in um, I think, it, it's too, yeah, it's not exactly. It's unpredictable, thank you. <laughs> it's, it's not, there's no pattern involved, really. So it's, it's, it's more, mm -hmm. um, uh, or at least it's less obvious. So it's more complicated. But I was just wondering how you explain the visual aspect of this. And it reminds me of this, you know, in Oliver Sacks' Awakenings, there's a, when he's working with the Parkinsonians, there are some that can't go around the corners anymore, but if you paint or draw or tape, I can't remember, curved lines, they can go. Uh -huh. And if you do straight lines, they have to stop right there. Yeah. And see, my, my belief is this all goes back to movement. You know, when, when there, there's a, a whole approach to, to perception that I didn't get into called the motor theory of perception. And, and, and there's a few uh, contemporary uh, uh, people who champion it today, including Ellen Berthas in France, uh, that believe that all acts of perception, the way we localize any object in space is to project how we would move, how and how much we would move in order to get there. And that's a theory that's actually been around for over 100 years. Uh, well, uh, one of the best quotes is from Poincaré, who said, to, lo to localize any object in space is to create within myself the muscle movements that would take me there. But isn't that, isn't that Miro, uh, is that taking on the Lucid's idea of Miro? Uh, Miro neurons? Mirror neurons. Mirroring on, uh, on you, you. I think that's very tied up in it. You know, I, I don't, uh, I don't know, I, I couldn't say what the exact relationship is, but I think that it's very tied up in it, too, that when, yeah. When I, whenever I see something, I reenact inside to make any judgment about it. So, and so the pair of neurons are um, operating in, in that you are sympathetic to whatever it is you're really watching or imagining. Yeah, I mean, I think I think mirror neurons are maybe more of a subspecies of just uh, the brain is sometimes called a biological simulator, uh, and it's or a, you know its its main job is prediction and simulation. 
and making guesses about the future. And so I think we very naturally take in events and start working with them inside in the mechanisms of the brain. And I think that, that, that we're finding that you know, the brain evolved for movement. A perception evolved to aid movement. First we had movement and it was really the perception immediately started to grow more sophisticated and see creatures. Right? It grew to, to assist beings in movement. And so movement is really at the basis of a lot more of cognition than it's been given credit for. And I think with things like visual patterns allowing Parkinsonians to move, again, when people see those curved lines, it allows them to create some kind of movement within themselves. Picking up what you were saying, uh, I'm aware that uh, people with Alzheimer's, sometimes who can't even articulate a thought, can yet remember a song and remember the lyrics to a song and can sing the lyrics to a song and then yet not be able to articulate a sentence. So do we know what kind of neurological, why could someone be able to sing something? I guess it goes back to the idea of prosody, of, of the fact that when we talk we're singing to some degree. but those people who have neurological damage who cannot put one word in front of another, yet they can sing a song from their youth and know every lyric and know every word perfectly. Do they sing that song with emotion, or do they just? Well, somewhere in their memory, they'll be able to remember that song and the lyrics, but it's bizarre that they can't articulate the sounds. Yeah. They enjoy it a lot. I mean, in my, I mean, I, you know, I, I had uh, when my the first use of cognitive rhythmics was at an Alzheimer's. Uh, Second stage Alzheimer's, a, day, a daycare, daycare is not the word, a, a Delta Services Center, a Delta Services Center in my old neighborhood. And uh, there was in particular one woman, and she's in the, the paper I wrote on Alzheimer's, which is at my website, just sat like a stone for the first several lessons. But, and and all, the, all the music I played was Gershwin, ragtime, old time, rhythmic music. And then the funniest thing happened, I have to look at my story to remember, but I believe she was someone and her feet just started, you can't see this, so I'm gonna tell you it was something else. She started <laughs> to do something very imperceptibly with the music, and I saw it, and I said, you know what? That's right in time with the music, how funny is that? And then I changed the tempo of the music. <laughs> yeah, and, and the woman was, boom, I mean, a complete stone. Impassive. And so, but from that moment on, I treated her like she was completely there, and one day she just kind of woke up and started doing some talking, I mean, it was amazing. Well, I have a lot of stories like that from this her. This reminds me yeah. sort of anecdotally, you know, but along similar lines, there used to be an entertainer who was a country western singer, I think his name was Mel Tillis. Right, Tillis. Yeah, oh. and he had a terrible stutter. And he, oh, yeah. he would go on, on these, you know, you know, Johnny Carson would have him on, he'd go on other shows, and, and they'd interview him, and it was comical. I mean, he, he acknowledged that he had a terrible stuttering mm -hmm. problem. He, as soon as he got out there and started singing, though, stutter went away. Yeah. Absolutely. And so if he wanted to say a sentence without a stutter, he would sing it. And then he was fine. He had the sense of rhythm, he had the sense of structure, whatever it was. There was something that mm -hmm. uh, was always a uh, yeah, part of that. So if we imagine it, you have perceptions coming in in this oscillatory way, you have action patterns that are stored in a stereotypical way that are then released, modulated to match the outside environment. What I think is going on is music is somehow picking up some of that slack. Mm -hmm. And that is really, for me, the opening. You know, how is music picking up that slack? To me, that's, that's the real question in terms of you know, the healing power of music, at least you know, in terms of these neurological situations with Alzheimer's and, and Parkinson's and stuttering and everything. There's some way that the coordination is not happening and music enables it somehow. It allows the right things to release in the right way. And for me, this plays off of Dalcroze's goal of getting the music in the body. And, when, and my belief is when you get the music in the body, you give them the tools to make, make up their own slack and overcome these problems or ameliorate them at least. Yeah, there's a question there. Have you found any special value, education, <coughs> educational value in teaching children or even adults to, to sing, play, beat one rhythm against a very different two against three, five against four? Every musician has to do this. <laughs> That's and right. Have to feel this difference. But just to learn, the Dalco used to do this all the time. That's right. <laughs> is that very educational? Can a child be pushed I, I make I make a lot of use of that. I do. Um, and, you know, I, I'm, I'm racing right now to come up with the way I've used it pretty <laughs> recently. You know, I just do, um, I just do, uh, you know, the way I get into that often is play music the octave below middle C and it walk this and then clap this up here, walk this, and then combine them in some way. You know, and that's a very common one I use for developing this stuff. I think there's something, because I think a, a, higher, a higher order has to be going on in order to take 
two things that are coming in. You know, there's a whole, uh, one, of the, one of the pioneers of music psychology is, is involved in something called auditory scene analysis, or, or what's called stream segregation. In other words, all the noise in the world is coming in at once in one glob. And yet we create out of it this scene of all these things that are happening. How do we do that? And there's been a lot of really interesting research on that. But I think it plays into this exact same thing. I've got two things. I've got to be able to think of them as two separate lines. But then some governor inside, some governing mechanism of some kind, has to create a unified response. Because that's all we're really capable of is unified response. And fluency, it's funny, I was just talking about this with a student the other day. Fluency, to me, in, in poly polyrhythm, let's say, if, if you mean, do you mean, can we call that polyrhythm for now? I mean, yeah. in, in, in you know, two-track rhythm, mm. uh, is really comes from having worked through kind of every combination that will come up in that sort of situation. And as a result, being able to feel like you're doing two things at once, but really, it's, it's being processed as a unity. So I think some kind of second-order watcher has to emerge. And I think that that uh, is a tremendously powerful learning lesson, learning lesson for kids, because I think that's really what they've got to do. I mean, they've got... Uh, you know, sounds and sights and language and movement, and they have to, some kind of operator in there has to be bringing it all together and sorting out it in one piece. I think it's the same operation. Yeah. Music strikes me, I mean, along the same lines, as a kind of, there are cliches of culture that we might be interested to, to sort of analyze in terms of the effect of music versus, you know, you always, if you see a movie, you'll have the, 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 the candlelight of the music and the love making following. You know. But, the, but it's, if you take the cliche apart, then there's some kind of probably interesting relationship between music and motor and, and sort of motor mechanisms. Uh, but then on the other from a political point of view, I read an article in the, in the uh, I think in your, your, your books recently, and it was in relation to one of Beethoven's symphonies, the joy to. Um, Oh, oh, to joy. Yeah, you know, to joy and, and its relationship to certain types of political uh, states that are, have been created by the music that it's used. It was used in the, you know, it's cross-cultural kind of. It was used in Germany. Yeah, massively. It's used in, yeah, yeah. So, I mean, it, this, it, there obviously are certain types of, that music plays in. Uh, I'm just, it's just, you know, I'm just free associating here. Mm -hmm. I'll stop my round. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's See. a powerful thing. Well, I mean, well, yeah, for instance, I mean, you had the so-called heroic music um, that, um, well, well, I mean, politically speaking, in, in Russia, for instance, you know, Proko uh, composers Prokofiev. like Prokofiev and Shostakovich, I mean, you know, they were really under, yeah, they, they were supposed to be a, a, a nationalist style, but it had certain considered sort of heroic qualities to it that were very powerful, I and mean, you, you weren't going to have probably... Um, impressionism coming out of those guys, you know, it had to be rhythmically very, very powerful, almost like marching. You know, marching is a very strong, mm -hmm. you know, re reminding us of armies. And so, I think if you wanted to write, uh, you know, powerful music for um, totalitarian government, you know, which would have a strong army, you know, you might want to really have a lot of marching feelings in it. You know, it's like a very powerful. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I, I there's, agree. There's been a bit of question back there also. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, well um, I'm very bad at multitasking. I mean, I like to focus on one thing when I'm doing it. I was thinking of this recently because I'm finishing a long writing project that I've been doing just for myself. And most days I do it in silence. You know, I don't have any music on it. Every once in a while, I have this insane desire to like play music while I'm working on my writing. And I always wondered whether that had an influence on me. Of course, there are a million possible sentences I could be generating, and I don't have a control experiment to, to find out. But I discovered that I'm either I write, if I go through this process of playing music and trying to do some writing, I discovered that I either haven't heard the music at all, or I haven't been writing. I don't find that I'm doing both. So I wonder, this, and our discussion makes me think, are there certain vibrations oscillating lights, um, mm, buzzing sounds at a certain frequency that are associated with hampering or enhancing creativity or certain kinds of behavior? I mean, interestingly, it's not really anything that I've looked into that much, and I, and I don't know that much about it. I mean, for me, the, the gateway to really having this music impact the brain's movement. Mm -hmm. And, you know, there's a lot of a lot of good research and, of course, a lot of complete charlatanism about 
well, Mozart effect, etc. about, you know, music going into your brain and your brain appreciating it and taking it in an X and Y happening to it. And there are some methods that I think are worth knowing about, like Guy de Virar and, and uh, uh, Tomatis, which use filtered sounds of the mother's voice to kind of reconstruct parts of the brain that they feel were not properly developed in, autis in autism. And and other, and other. There have been studies done about the, like, the frequency of fluorescent lighting and that it does, it is, has been proven to increase the occurrence of migraine headaches. Mm -hmm. um, also, colicky babies, I don't know if there has been a study done, but colicky babies have been known to stop crying if you turn on a dust buster and it really gets in their chest. It's something to do with the vibration. No, seriously. Sure. <laughs> Can I, yeah. can I make a comment about that? Um, it's pretty well known that colicky babies respond to getting up at night, taking them out and driving them in the car. Right. Or um, there is actually a little device that you can now put on the bottom of the crib Ooh, that causes the crib uh, yeah. And the best one was when my, when my brother was colicky, and this was a long time ago, maybe 50 or so years ago, um, we were advised to um, do the laundry. Mm -hmm. My mom was advised to do the laundry, and then when the washing machine was in its spin cycle, to pick up the baby and put the baby, you know, pull the baby on top of the, of the washing machine, and the baby would always go to sleep. That's the washing machine theory. That's from years ago. That's amazing. Yeah. Well, there was a sound, too, but I think it was mostly the vibration. I wasn't fascinating, but I, what about a vibration that doesn't put you to sleep, but I don't know, wakes you up or inspires you? Yeah, but, but when you have colic, it's not just like you're awake and you're going to sleep. Okay. It's like you're, you know, you're, organi you're organizing the child into something that's a more organized state. I mean, when you talk about the Charlotte movement, do you have any, if there's any validity to these things where they say that cows like Mozart and they'll, they'll milk them and they'll have more milk or the chickens will like Mozart? <laughs> They've apparently done studies where they do rap music and the chickens don't lay eggs. And they, <laughs> <laughs> when they rock and roll and they don't lay eggs and they play Mozart and they lay eggs. So maybe it's not just the human brain, but there are things in Mozart. I mean, you know, I haven't milked the cows with Mozart, but apparently there, there are dairies that like to play and they say the cows deliver more milk. So there may be something to the vibrations that are, you know. Yeah, I mean, my, my general feeling about reading things like that is I wish, I mean, I, I think there's something to it, I do. And, and uh, of course, it's all my own speculation, but I wish that the body would be included and not just music entering the brain. I really just don't think that's the model for, for, for how we're going to figure out how music impacts the human being. I really think that, that the first stop for music is the body, always. And, you know, with a cow, well, first of all, I think you need, you, you need to have a, a acoustic music to really have a certain type of impact. I think that speakers are never, and digitized music will never be the same as, you know, kind of an honest analog vibration traveling. So, you know, live music for a cow would be the only study I'd accept, you know, as a felon. And, and then, you know... It might be hard bringing a quartet into the barn, but... <laughs> and you know, I'd be interested in what kind of sounds cows make and when. And yeah, I, I, I really think that, and you know, there's, I, I don't know much about this, but there's, every organ has a resonant frequency, you know, and, and it, there may very well be some, some connection between the music you play and what kind of resonant frequencies you would be getting in the cow's organs or things, something like that. Yeah, but actually, uh, just to follow up a little bit on that, though, um, if you think about, um, you know, the, the human heartbeat, being around 60 beats, um, generally, that that often we have a natural affinity towards tempos that are that are you know, derived from 60, whether it's 120, mm -hmm. 60, 180. You know that there's a, a relationship there, and it's a very natural feeling, actually, to find a tempo sometimes, and especially when you're dealing with some of the earlier composers who've written dance music. It's meant. It, that specifically is meant to be moved to, and so so I remember um, with with my teacher Arthur Grimier, I was playing a, um, a Bach movement for him as a minuet, and uh, and he he stopped me almost immediately, and he said, if I were dancing to this, I'd, I'd be up in the chandelier by now. <laughs> it was too fast. Uh, so anyway, you know, and so there's a, yeah, there there is a very strong association with with um, obviously with with dance tempos and movement patterns and but but where do those come from you know well, the, the desire that the 
you know, the ease of dancing in a three meter, for instance, versus, you know, a two step or something. I find it a lot easier to. Or out. whether the three meter contains just a natural balance of even and uneven and, you know, and, and new and old, you know, kind of a perfect. And, you know, the average length of a, a breath is three seconds, and that turns out to be the average length of a phrase in classical music. And actually, if you do the math, I think if you have four beats at 72, in four, four, four measures, it's just about three seconds. So there's mm -hmm. this complete convergence upon the length of a breath in the classical, the average classical phrase, for whatever that's mm -hmm. worth, you know, and then and often the average phrase is set up and then it's broken, and, you know, and that creates tension, you know, in ways that we might, might be partially, you know, partially Leonard Meyer in structure and may partially also be physiological. Uh -huh. You're reminding me of something. Uh, in our last concert, I made some arrangements of uh, two Scott Joplin rags, which were piano rags, and I did them for a clarinet with string quartet, and I thought, this will be fun. And I talked to the clarinetist, he said, this is great. I gave him the music. He said, this is wonderful. And then we got to the end of the first rehearsal, and he said to me, you know, there's no place for me to breathe. And I thought, oh, yeah. You know? <laughs> You know, because it's ragtime, it was just sort of this constant stuff, and he's doing the yeah. stuff, and I thought, oh yeah. I mean, he managed fine. He found, you know, he's, he's great, so he could, he could find a place to breathe. He didn't have to, you know, suddenly stop and, and you know, super fill his lungs. But, but yeah, I just, oh yeah, you've got to really keep about these things in mind. Yeah. And, and sometimes with, with piano, where you don't have to stop, or with even with the violin, you know, we sort of sometimes get separated, and I'm always talking to my own students yeah. then about, phrasing and you have the full breath and you have the comma and you can have you, know, you can make sort of a colon and so it ultimately becomes very much like a form of language that you know that you're the parsing you know the, the phrasing and, and um, deciding what is the high point how to inflect this so, and, and you make me think that barbershop quartets which I think were around the same time as Scott Joplin have all these commas you know? uh -huh, yeah. they're always pausing to take those breaths it's a <laughs> yes. whole, different, whole different set of music <laughs> The uh, let's start with the body. That's where you wanted to start. Right? And it is that in sports, you can actually drive, if you use music, you can actually get a speed out of an athlete that he cannot run naturally. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I've, I've taken athletes up to seven steps a second by wow. using music. And that's, they, well, the, um, the Olympic record for the 200 is not is something like I think five feet five steps per second. Mm -hmm. mm. And yet, if you do some music and music, if you teach the athlete right, that athlete can go up to um, seven, eight steps a second. It's incredible when you think of it, or you try to even beat that pattern out with your hand. But you can. You first you have to start with a simple rhythm like a metronome. And the metronome goes higher and higher. And every day, say about every day they come in, you give them a beat ten beats faster. Just like just like running a musical tough yeah. musical passage. So you're in 180, 190, 200, 300, and so, suddenly the person is talking out at 360 steps a minute. And it's not. It That's cannot, fascinating. It yeah. can't yeah. be done without music, but it can be done with music. Mm. And it's almost like you're la It's almost like you're layering your, the process. Because the first process is just a metronome. The second, you have to lay a pattern on the metronome. Mm. So the first, you run. The third is um, what's it? The third phase is when you retain the the pattern on the metronome to a song or something like that. Mm. And, the, yeah. and the fourth would be just when you um, when you lay down a pattern, say of um, 300, 360 beats per minute. And then, when the athlete is running at that pace, you introduce the drums. Uh -huh. And the drums will take that athlete into, into well, you, the nearest thing I can describe it is that you say the, the person is in the, the, they're in the groove. Yeah, and absolutely. It takes you beyond yourself. Right? Yeah, because it does. It takes them completely out of themselves. Yeah, yeah. And I've never been able, I've been trying to understand how that could be used in terms of, um, of improving athletics generally, because it, it um, it's um, we're in the situation of say um, America is trying to beat the Kenyans in running, and they they will not do it in distance, but they can do it if they learn if they can learn to generate a pattern which is closer to the pattern they need for the actual marathon rather than over, um, the, the Africans are doing over distance, 
150 miles mm -hmm. a week. But that's not the answer. The answer is really to be able to concentrate on, say, a two-hour framework and try to see how much you can get the athlete to run faster and faster and faster for that period of time. Because it's all, it's all they really need in order to accomplish the marathon. And, you, and the other thing too with the body and mind is you can't learn to run fast by running slow. No. And this is what this is this is, this is basically process. the approach of the, the, the Africans and the Kenyans. Is to run long distances and then try to rev it up at the last minute. Whereas if you learn speed from the beginning and you can generate it musically. It's very it, it seems to me as if it's it's a very complex way of working, but it seems to me that the more complex the, the whole pattern becomes, the easier it is to generate high speed. Because it seems that somewhere along the line, the body is tagging the different movements, the different sequences which are necessary to some specific beat. And so you find that within that, you're actually, in other words, if you lay down right, the more complicated it is, the faster the person can run. And this is all. This is all mind, uh, mind, uh, mind, body. Ab absolutely. You know, I was once in, in, in talking with a person in the Equinox about trying to do something there on the premise that this discipline that allows you to take music inside your body may be of great use to athletes, mm -hmm. and it may be that runners would be interested in even just a classical rhythmics class in which they're representing different music and rhythm in their body and what it feels, how their body feels different in different tempos and speeds and different musical figures that might be of interest to us. I kind of do that at Equinox in spinning classes. If the teacher's good, there's always a soundtrack of music yes. and he'll switch the songs mm -hmm. to increase the number of pedals you do per second. Mm -hmm. right. And you, as you probably know, I mean, I'm very interested in distance running. You probably know they banned iPods. You, you can't use them during a marathon because they were worried people, I mean, there's probably other things you could do, like have it say, you know, half an hour. but. But uh, because they thought it was like a performance-enhancing drug. <laughs> but, 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 I, I suggest that the, the way to use it with learning in the uh, preparatory stage and internalize it to the point where you would not need it in the actual race itself because the whole thing can be internalized. Yeah. So, so that even when you're starting to run, before you start the race, you, start, you really start humming it to yourself. One two, one two, one two, one two, one two, one two, and then when the, when the, you're running at it, and if you if you've done it long enough, the body's internalized it. It will it will run at that rate. And I think very subtle rhythmic distinctions can be felt in the body. I certainly felt that as a performer. I relied on that a lot. I mean, I mean, I, you know, if I knew I wanted my recapitulation to be slightly more out there than my exposition, I, I would rely on a feeling and not any kind of analysis of the sound. I think you can feel these distinctions much more than you can think about them. Mm -hmm. I just wanted to know if you could give more examples of, of the things that you did, or that you do with children um, to create this, like you said with the, the mm -hmm. drums. Yeah, what examples of anything in particular? Um, well, I mean, kind of, I can't remember who exactly said it before, but um, like when I think they were saying, that they were mentioning something about um, reading disabilities mm -hmm. that you said we would get to later. Mm -hmm. and so just some any any kind of neurological you get problem. The, the ball out also do it again. Yeah. Uh -huh. Yeah, I do. Maybe she would uh, be your co -dancer. Yeah, maybe you'd <laughs> volunteer. Um, I sort of wanted to mull over reading for a second, but uh, in in terms of in terms of attention. Like I said, there's often an issue with hierarchy, so that you can have people who are children who are absolutely brilliant and expressive. And I mean, I, went, I once had one child who, um, you know, I'm not entirely sure what his diagnosis was, but his it was clearly because his short-term attention and memory was just zero. And what was amazing was he could do these incredible imitations. I could know what band he listened to that week, <laughs> even though he couldn't play any piano. He would just stand and hit the piano. And he would move his body and sing, and I knew who he'd been listening to because his, his image, but it never contained anything. So it was like he could just take snapshots of the world. And actually, in over a year and a half, I taught him how to play Twinkle Twinkle Little Star on the piano. Actually, it's really funny. But, but the type of stuff we would do would be, um, let's see, how am I going to do this in here? Well, stand up and I'll, I'll show you how this works. Well, so if I had him there, and I would say, how many times did I bounce this ball? How many times did I bounce it? Three. Okay. All right, and he would say three, and then I would bounce it. 
How many times did I bounce this ball? Four. And he would say four, and then I would go like this. And I would say how many times, and he would say either three or four, depending on what was the right answer the last time. No ability to process that. And you see, that's what's very interesting about psychological phenomena like the railroad tracks, right? We automatically do divide railroad tracks into groups of two and three. We hear that even though it's not really there. Because as soon as information comes in, it needs to be categorized. It needs to be in a hierarchy or there's just instant pileup. I mean, you couldn't get to your front door. Mm -hmm. You know, and I mean, he just, if I bounce it seven times, it's just instant pileup. So how did I start this out? Well, he could count fours. So I did four beat measures. So I said, so one, two. Two, three, four, and I would have him try that and count while he did it. Wait, jump, throw it first. That's right. So then I'm creating multi layers without making him have to think about much of anything. And then I would change the count. And this happens over time. I don't know how clear it is that this could unfold over time, but one, two, three, four, two. Three, bounce, 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 four, bounce. And now I can get him to focus on a much more sustained task. Mm -hmm. And what's maybe not entirely clear is I'm relying on him to be able to feel in his body that this has been three mm -hmm. without having to, to tokenize it. It's the real word that I want to use, but without having to count that out and interfere with his other counting. Mm -hmm. But he's, he's good enough that he can track three. Mm -hmm. So I can have him do like eight measures. I'm, I've sort of gotten you up and haven't had you do much, but... but um, and then I'd say after eight measures, he gets to run around the room or yeah. bang on the piano or something. <laughs> and that's how I would get into sustained tasks. I would have him do very, very simple actions that he could manage. And then I would have him build hierarchies out of those actions using basic musical meters. Mm -hmm. Now, in terms of how that would apply to language, again, with language, you often do not get... Well, some of the work I do with language is with dynamics, mm -hmm. you know, musical dynamics, because uh, children can maybe take them in when they hear them, but they can't put them in their movement at all. And depending on how conceptual they are, I may teach them the Italian words for dynamics, because that creates a, a special language that we can use. Mm -hmm. you know, or, I might just, uh, or I might just use the letters. Actually, I don't have props here for this, but I, I have sheets of paper with all the different dynamic symbols. You know? and, I might give, and I would give them the drum and I would, I would point, point to one or another. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and, or I would have the xylophone and I would play expression and I would point to one or another. Mm -hmm. And that would get them using different dynamic nuance and then I would take that into a nursery rhyme. Mm -hmm. I mean, for me, Mother Goose is it, you know? Yeah. Whoever that was was a total genius. Yeah. And, and, it, and particularly her understanding of how you need rhythm to teach language. Mm -hmm. Rhythm and rhyme are really the key things for teaching all the parts of language. So I'm, I'm sorry that I got you up and didn't have much for you to run around and do. But, but those, are, those, those are things I use for speech. I mean, for music, I had one student, and she was, um, you know, her verbal scores are like 99%, but her visual processing scores are like 1%, basically almost like she's one. And I have her, um, and I taught her those Italian, you know, pianissimo, I teach you pianissimo. You know, we, we had rhythms for each, you know, pianissimo, pianissimo. Piano, 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 forte, forte, fortissimo, forte. And then we would do movements, and I would ask her what kind of, you know, which one is this? You know, pianissimo, which one? And then the real trick is to get them to find the middle ones. Because then you're dealing with something that in special needs is called thresholds, mm -hmm. which we, everybody knows is a big problem. So, for example, over, uh, and this is something I look for a lot, especially when I start working with a student, is slow, slow quiet to medium, they can imitate what I do. And then as soon as it goes over moderately loud, they just go as hard as they can. Mm -hmm. They just go crazy. And with music, you can really f do something to help that. Because you can, you can start to draw these different distinctions just in pattern of sound. That they, and you want them to just reflect it in their body so there's no, no task you're asking them to do and there's no judgment in a way and there's none of the uh, baggage of language. And they just would like to see, okay, you know, and if, so if, if I, you know, if I play, if I played, you know, bum, 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 and he just went, you know, I would say, okay, you showed me this one. And then I would play it very loud and then just take it down one tick. You know, now show me that. And then he would try to find some way to modulate that. And I can get him into a whole area of reactions he didn't have another time. And then sometimes, if I'm lucky, the, the, the school teacher will mention that, you know, he has more variety of responses or something like that. Yes. You know, I think music is, can be the teacher for movement patterns and that enables these kids to have more options in, in life. So. Any more questions?
it sounds like you don't always know what the child's diagnosis is. But there are certain phenomena that you're going to work with. Is that That's the true. case that you don't? Because you'll find perhaps some sort of final common pathways of behavior that you'll see. And you can work with those perhaps regardless of what the actual process is by which they, mm. they happened. It's, it's, yeah. Is that, I mean, I mean, no, that's that, exactly right. I mean, it's, I mean, I mean, in the early days, I would even for, forget to ask, but then I realized it didn't look very professional. You know, I, I, I really, I mean, I want to see how they respond to my, to these activities of music and movement, and I, you know, educate them in that direction. And I really don't claim to be doing anything else. You know, and my theory is, you know, really a theory that I put. This is the only way I find to explain it. But um, I. I, my, my sole interest is really in how they move to music. And what's nice about that is it frees me for having to think of them in one way or another. And often people with the same, you know, these diagnoses are all umbrella terms, right? And every, I mean, every brain really is very, very different. We do know that. And, and, and the same thing that can work for two very differently diagnosed people, the same techniques can work for them and a different techniques can work for other people. And, uh, and somehow that enables me to just be right with them as a human being, just to see how, you know, to find a, a, a rhythmic flow, a game that's their speed with them, uh, and just to take that a step further every time is, is exactly what interests me, and not, not really the diagnosis terms. When you're working with children, do you sometimes work with the parents as well and teach them some of these skills that they can be doing? Yeah, well? I think that's important. I mean, I, I particularly like to give, you know, I particularly like to, to get some result in there and, and try to figure out how we can apply this. And, uh, often, and, and you know, you, you, it's trickery in some ways. I mean, walking into the room, walking out of the room, walking out to the car, I might come along and kind of be using the whatever new movement I think they've got for that day, and get, get them to find ways to do it on the way out to the car and let the mom see, you mm -hmm. know, and kind of get that all set up so that the mom can try to use it at home for certain things. And, uh -huh. and that definitely works. Sometimes. But do you ever have classes that are really uh, designed for the parents of these children? or? Uh, you know, I, I don't, I don't, I mean, I, uh, if it's working well, I would prefer to just be me and the child. Uh -huh. okay. um, and then we always bring the mom in at the end to show what we've done. But I think there's a big, mm -hmm. a big learning factor there in, in having, have, in asking the child to show what they figured out how to do. That allows it to deepen. That's a big mm -hmm. payoff for the kid. Mm -hmm. So actually that is how I normally do it. And how often do you work with children typically? Oh, once, once a week. week. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And how long is the, a session? 45 minutes usually. Yeah. And do you have some, some, some children with whom 45 minutes is way too long, and so you must work with them for a much shorter period of time? Or Yeah, well, you know, if it's way too long, I tend to let it wind down in the middle and, mm -hmm. and find something else to pick up with on the end. Um, mm -hmm. But yeah, there are, there are kids. I mean, I mean, there are kids for who... <laughs> I had one boy who... This was actually a small semi-private group that I got set up with. And he just ran and ran and ran around the room and pushing and bumping and had no other options. And the peak, the, the, the total interaction was about three seconds. Oh. But it was good. I mean, I had this musical thing going and it was a stop game. And all the other kids would stop. You know, he would just be like, you know, and that was it. But the mom saw it, you know, I mean, it was, and he never that does that. Yeah. 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 And that's, that's my gateway, right? Mm -hmm. And actually there, well, there's one boy who's in my case studies and he, uh, he was three and a half, and he had these huge leg braces, and he never, he couldn't stand still, just there was no, I mean, I get this in a few different ways, a lot of times there was no, uh, you know, balance point for him, no, 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 yeah. no, no, no equilibrium for him. Okay. And, and, and he just kind of wandered with all the activities, very, very small, and then one day I found the right tempo, and he just... Fantastic. And that was it, and there were the yeah. tempo, the range was that big that yeah. I could get him to do that, wow. you know, but... But it's you find just the right thing and you get the organization. Yeah, and that was, you know, that was all I was... Uh-huh. Now, would you, you know. say the majority of the, the kids that you work with, are they on some sort of medication for... I, uh, you know, I often don't even really don't know. know. Yeah. <laughs> I prefer them not to be. Yes. For the same, you know, I have a friend yeah. who actually teaches children's ballet who has a rule, no medication, because yeah. Yeah. Uh, the talent often gets stifled by it. And so for me, also, I think the musicality can be, and I prefer to have uh -huh. them, prefer them off. But, you know, things are... So, you know, the parents need to do what they need to do. So. Well, speaking of ballet, though, I remember when I was a kid, I was in high school with a lot of ballerinas who were going, you know, they were actually still working with Balanchine in those days. And mm -hmm. I would see them practicing in the hallway, and they're doing their combinations. They're always counting out off to themselves. They were never singing a melody. And the first day I were realized that... Were you in LaGuardia that, or something? 
Huh? Were you at LaGuardia? You said you were in high school. You um, were a lot of ballerinas. Professional children's. School. Oh, you PCS. Yes, okay. Professional yeah. child. Yes. Uh, <laughs> Um, yeah, and so, so I, was, I was amazed the first time I realized that they were just sort of counting off numbers to themselves and, and, you know, and, and doing a, a rhythm with a, a number, you know, and, uh -huh. and, and, and putting together combinations, because I always thought, oh, they're moving to music, and they're listening to the music, and, you know, I always thought it was sort of this association like a musician might have that you're, you know, you're sort of uh -huh. responding to it, and no, <laughs> unfortunately. I think things have maybe changed a bit since then because um, it's interesting that Balanchine was always considered to be a very musical choreographer, and yet you talk to people who are. Uh, you heard the noise. I, I, okay. No, no. I, I, I have to think about that. I don't know if I. Yeah, I yeah, yeah. But I mean, talk to people who are conductors who are uh -huh. actually you know conducting ballet, and it's always I see. Okay. it's it's it has often nothing to do with how you would normally be conducting the flow of this music, but it has to do with the combinations of steps and how long can they be in the air before they come oh, back again, and you know very sort of technical things, and so sometimes it's a very unmusical feeling. But, I, uh, I had a dancer mother of, of a boy I worked with who said she really wished she'd had that because it's so great to have a background in rhythmic movement before you get so into technique, mm -hmm. you know, and that she was just right into technique and she never really had a way to let that rhythm out into her dancing in, in, a, in a free way. Mm -hmm. And I think that's true for musicians too. I think the dumpers class cycle. when they're young yeah. Yeah. and the background and just doing things rhythmically, then they have access to it when they, through their instruments someday. You know, you lay uh -huh. the groundwork for later. Well, sometimes it's, it's a releasing of, of things that have been trained into you that you're sort of exploring or improvising mm -hmm. upon something, which is, I think, you know, sort of um, touches on the, the fact that a lot of classically trained musicians have a hard time improvising, and yet you improvise on the piano. So, so what do you find? I abandon everything for improvisation. I love uh -huh. improvisation, yeah. Yeah. But it was, it was like building a technique from scratch all over again, uh -huh. completely. What was the process for you to, to be able to do that? Because you're, you're leaving behind the structures. We've been talking about structures sort of all along and, you know, the need for them and whether you call it a pattern or a structure and the rhythm and, and sort of recognizing it and also perhaps memorization being a part of it, mm -hmm. recognition, familiarity. And then when you go into improvisation, I suppose you're dealing a little bit with familiarity. I mean, you know what chords might work coming out of this mm -hmm. combination of notes, but tell me about it. Yeah, it's, it's been a great trip into the unknown. And Well, you know, all to, to get certified to teach Delcras, and it takes years, and you have to develop a, a basic improvisational facility at the piano. and. Uh, and that's, quite, that's one of the, you know, probably the most challenging aspect of the training for a lot of people. But I had to do it for that and for playing for movement. And the truth is, as soon as you start doing it, you realize the better you improvise, the better the children will move for you. I mean, it's just night and day. Somebody sits down with a slightly different touch and the children just go. I mean, there's truth in that. You know, you can't, you yeah. can't be denied, you know, because children are so honest. And, and so that really led me to think about what, especially in relationship to this, I mean, what you know, what do I think music really is and what's the source of it? And, and you know, my improvisation is very... Western classical, but I tend to just kind of take motives and let them develop into things, you know, and let forms kind of come out of that and break back down. And uh, and I feel I've really, yeah, I mean, I really feel like I've understood how music is put together in a totally different way. You know, in in, in an analysis course, you might learn that themes are treated this way and this way and this way, but. What improvisation did, I'll just say this one thing, what improvisation did for me was, it allows me to, it's almost like you're seeing the theme from inside, like from the driver's seat. Oh, and then the reason for the contrasting section is not that was a convention or it's not that they happened to do it. It was that if you're making that theme, you, the need for contrast comes upon you, you know? Well, yeah, sometimes when I'm, I'm playing a piece, you know, you, you talk about rubato, you know, which is stretching tempo and, um, you know, sort of straying a little bit from this, this precision precision of, of rhythmic, rhythmic meter. Um, but sometimes I feel like I'm, I'm sort of, it's, I'm, I'm, get, I'm feeling how the music wants to be played, how the phrase wants to come out. And so I guess, you know, maybe, or this is, this is sort of a, a similar idea mm -hmm. that you have. It's not necessarily that you're, you're taking a structure and, and sort of putting one structure in with another one. You're just sort of allowing it its own flow mm -hmm. and uh, letting it happen. Because mm -hmm. you feel that it should happen this way. Yeah. Yeah, that's very much what it feels like. And so I began to understand a lot of musical devices from, I mean, at least for me, it was really an epiphany, you know, instead of laying them out through practice, but like seeing, oh yeah, the need for contrast is now, the need for recapitulation is now, you know, but the need for a slightly different thing is now. And, and uh, I don't know, it's kind of getting to know music from the inside is a uh -huh. unique uh -huh. process. I just, this is, I think, relevant to the movement because I studied improvisation for several years at that interest time. I was a great jazz pianist. And one of the things, it wasn't intellectual, it wasn't intellectual. One of the things you were to do every week was to sing Billie Holiday and then more difficult with Charlie Parker. 
with Hardy Singer. Yeah, I think so. And I remember a passage where I, I was starting to count something out. He said, don't count it, just feel it. Mm. And that was sort of the basic rule, always just <coughs> listen carefully enough and let your body attune to the music. You could do that. Mm -hmm. just feel it. Mm -hmm. I wanted to know if you used any um, higher technologies in your work. Um, I know that there's a lot of development in video games and in um, those kinds of things for for these kinds of um, develop, helping children develop their cognitive abilities. And I want to know if you found any particularly useful or if you used any at all. Yeah, no, I, I'm, I'm, I'm very low tech. <laughs> uh, always. And for me, I'm big on acoustic sounds. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, I think children hearing these can't sound, I, I really have a problem with it because what we're, we're supposed to understand something when we hear sound about where things are and how big they are and all, all this. And when you have canned sound, you're really kind of teaching the brain to ignore that, I think. So, for me, yeah, I mean, I'm sort of an Amish therapist almost. I mean, I just, just very basic acoustic things. And with the movement at the center, like, I, I don't, I, you know, I, I, I um, uh, a friend of mine who, who runs the uh, uh, yeah. Optimal Center in, in, in Hartsdale does rhythmic metronome. It's one of the things he does there. He's also a character. And they, they have gotten results with rhythmic metronome. I mean, it really works. Um, I think that, and you know, and that's a body thing. I mean, you're really beating time with the metronome and the things change and you have to do this and that. And, uh, and for me, you know, it's, it's, it shows that even, even doing something very one dimensional, just this kind of beats as a point in time, but doing it with your body helps kids pay attention better. I, I think they've gotten results with that. Also, you know, with Dalkers, they've actually done gait studies in Switzerland now with this very interesting doctor, a geriatrician, Reto, Reto Kressig, and uh, they measure gait after a Dalkers class and before and after the, uh, the uh, geriatric uh, people walk as if they're at least 20 years younger. Mm -hmm. you know, they can actually measure that by looking at the way the gait looks when they step on the sensor thing. Mm -hmm. Uh, so, and the, so they've had some really nice work over there on how rhythmic movement can, can help tune these things up. Any more questions? One more question. Yes. <laughs> Funny. That's your story. Um, the information that we got about this uh, evening said that you had some personal experiences that led to your getting involved in this work. And since it was written down, I assume that it would be okay to ask you if you would yeah. say something about that. Well, yeah, I grew up with Tourette's syndrome. You know, and the thing is, Tourette's, Tourette's decreases with age generally. So I, I don't want to make any extravagant claims. You know? yeah, but certainly, well into my 20s, it was still around, very visible. And when I wasn't thinking about it, very audible, although I could kind of uh, repress that for interviews or something. and. Uh, and I really got into rhythmic movement and Delcros and things like that. And the first person I sort of worked on, the first idea I had was, you know, this idea of internalizing rhythms. It's huge in Delcros that an understanding of music is really internalization of music and having it inside yourself. And I thought, well, you know, Tourette's is really people doing things kind of out of sync. What if an internalization of rhythm allowed them to do things more in sync or to get themselves in sync? And so I began to work on myself in this way. And that was really what got me interested in the whole cognitive side of it. It's like, well, you know, I know that I feel like things just aren't lining up. You know, and there's, there's this, this, this great old uh, scientist, William Condon, who did sound film analysis of people. And their whole body synchronizes with them while they speak. But people with disorders, actually, the body breaks into five different rhythms while they speak. Exactly five men with the disorder. Very interesting. And, um, and I always felt like, Things were fragmenting somehow. And when I, uh, and like a lot of Tourette's, when I played piano, it went away. And everybody knows that certain rhythmic movements, music and swimming and things like that, um, and Tai Chi as well, makes the Tourette's go away. And, uh, and so for me, I thought, well, you know, Del Crow's, you know, educates this relationship that I can carry around with me. So maybe that would give me some way to, to get on top of this. I would have some, some information within myself I could use kind of counterbalance it. And, and that's what I feel I developed. And my Tourette's syndrome did basically go away, you know. Um, and I'm very interested in, at some point, working with the Tourette's community, but it's sort of a, a crazy theory, and I've never gotten any, any interest over it there. I've been to their national conferences, actually, a couple times. Um, but that, that, is, that was really the genesis of, 
of, of, of looking at the cognitive benefits and the you know, learning disability type benefits of this work. Well, Eric and Stephanie, I want to thank you very much for a marvelous evening. And I think we should, this is really a subject here for perhaps even some research that Philip Tades would be interested in doing. Uh -huh. so thank you very much. Oh, thank you for having me. Information about our programs and a complete archive of past Philip Tades events is available at philiptades.org.